we're continuing our study in the book of Mark, and we are in chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. Not a lot of verses, a very, very important passage of Scripture. And we're going to be taking a look at it this morning as we break it down and open it up. I've titled this morning's message, Come to Jesus. And there's a reason for that that we'll find as we go throughout our time together looking here in the book of Mark. Just some housekeeping as we get started this morning looking at our text. I want you to remember or to know or to maybe even realize for the first time that Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels. It's kind of written like a newspaper account. It just gives you the bare facts. It lays them out there. But even at that, Mark devotes five chapters to Jesus' death and the events that lead to it. That's how important the passion event is. We begin this five-chapter section of Mark this morning as we watch Jesus enter Jerusalem, knowing that very soon he's going to spread his arms and do for us what there was no way in the world we could do for ourselves. As we open up this passage here in the book of Mark, as we look at it, we're going to discover Mark's take this morning on the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Now, all of the gospel writers include this event in their books. They all talk about it, so we can assume that Jesus' visit to Jerusalem on this day was more important than any visit he made before. Because what happens when he comes into Jerusalem today In the day that we're looking at, in the day that we're studying, what happens when he triumphantly enters into the city of Jerusalem should give us shivers and chills. This visit is going to usher in his subsequent death when he substitutes himself for us on a hill called Calvary. Let's get started this morning by reading Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. It says there in Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse number 1, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Did you get that? which no one has ever written, untie it and bring it here. Now, if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it and will send it back shortly. Well, they went, they found the colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Now, we've got to get a picture here. Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem from Jericho. Remember in Jericho, he healed the blind man. We looked at that last week. Bartimaeus was healed on his way through Jericho. And now he's taking this journey of about 18 miles from Jericho over to Jerusalem in order that he can enter that city and face what he came to earth to face. As he's coming toward the city, he lays out some facts for his disciples that we will look at in some subsequent studies. But we need to understand this time he's heading into the city of Jerusalem. And as he's coming through, he he goes through a, a little area called Bethany. Now, Bethany is just a couple of miles off of the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is about two miles outside of Jerusalem, up on a little hill. I don't know why they call it a mountain. It's not really like a mountain. It's just a, a great big hill outside the city. Bethany is pretty close to that, and it's a pretty well-known town, but there's another little place called Bethpage nearby. We all know Bethany because that's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live. Remember when Jesus went there to raise Lazarus from the dead? Remember the story and the background of what happened there? Pretty much everybody knows where Bethany is, but not very many people have heard about Bethpage And yet, it's one of the little towns mentioned as we study here in the book of Mark. I can just imagine Jesus up on the hill at the Mount of Olives, looking out over the city of Jerusalem in the distance, looking at the temple, thinking to himself, I know what's going to happen there in just 70 short years. 
And those stones are going to be cast down. Everyone's going to be torn apart. Jesus knew what was going to happen. The people didn't know, but he knew what was coming. And he was, he was in essence, preparing his disciples for it. There was going to be a huge change away from temple worship and toward a worship that takes place inside of the heart. The kind of worship that we should be involved in today. Not because we are meeting in the Family Life Center. Not because we are meeting in the sanctuary. But because we are meeting our God face to face around the communion table. We are meeting our God. He is coming into our heart, circumcising our heart, purifying us on a weekly basis as we come before him and admit, Jesus, we know that you did for us what we couldn't possibly do for ourselves. It's that very thing that Jesus is about to do as he's making his way toward Jerusalem. And he knows it. Can you imagine if it was you heading into Jerusalem? Knowing that very soon you would be beaten with a cat of nine tails, that you would be lifted up on a cross, you would be nailed there, you would die there. Can you imagine the fear and the trepidation that the man part of you would be experiencing? And yet there's that God part of him that knows he must be both just and justifier. The price must be paid for our sin because the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God paid for by Jesus on Calvary is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus is setting the stage for what's coming next. He sends two of the disciples to a nearby village, and he says, I want you to pick me up a ride over at that little village over there. Now, Matthew makes it clear that his ride was to be a colt, a donkey colt. He makes that clear, I think, because that shows that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy that Zechariah made way back in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. You see, Zechariah, he predicted that the coming king, the someone who was coming, the someone who had come when Jesus arrived, the someone who's coming again, the, the coming king, the Messiah, would come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's how specific the Old Testament prophecy was concerning the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled them all to the T. These guys are to walk into town, look around, spy out the area, and look for an unbroken donkey that's tied up. You got that word unbroken donkey? An unbroken donkey that's tied up. And when they find it, they're to untie it and bring it to Jesus. Now on the surface, that sounds pretty simple. Go get an animal, bring it back to Jesus. It doesn't seem like a very big deal on the surface until you begin to think about it. Let's try putting this into something we can wrap our minds around. Okay? Donkeys are a means of transportation during this time. It'd be like us going out and getting our car. They'd go out and get on their donkey. It's their transportation during this time. And this is a brand new donkey. It's not even broke in good yet. Brand new donkey out there. This would have been something like someone getting a brand new, spanking new, shiny red Camaro. And they've got it sitting out in front of their house. And then all at once, as they're sitting up there on their porch admiring that red Camaro of theirs, Somebody comes along, begins trying to hotwire it and drive it off with it. That's kind of what's going on when they come to get this donkey. I'm pretty sure that the owners would have had something to say about their thievery. And they would have had every right to stop these disciples from taking the donkey. But Jesus had sent them. And I personally believe Jesus had prepared the owner of this donkey for this particular situation. We're not told how inside the scripture, so your guess is as good as mine. What we do know is that whenever these disciples got there and they began untying that donkey, whenever they were doing what Jesus had told them to do and they were stopped and questioned, they told that man exactly what Jesus had told them to tell him, and he was appeased. (laughs) They just said the Lord needs it. And he'll get it back to you shortly. Jesus promised that when they made this known, the donkey would be released. And sure enough, it was. They headed straight to the village. Find that little donkey. And to their amazement, 
rather than getting yelled at, rather than to get the proverbial police called on them, once they told them Jesus needed it, they just let it go. Imagine that. That's kind of how Jesus is, isn't it? When you do what he asks, things have a way of working out. That's exactly what happened on this day. When the disciples took this common everyday donkey to Jesus, he used it for his grand entrance into the city of Jerusalem. Now listen to this, friends, because this is an important statement. Even common things like an unbroken donkey, when placed in the master's loving hands, can be used to accomplish amazing things. Do you hear that? Even common things, when placed in the master's loving hands, can be used to accomplish amazing things. And I am so glad because I'm about as common as they get. I'm a junkyard boy. Grew up on a junkyard with a bunch of hillbillies. And I'm glad God can use me. And I dare say all of us have backgrounds that we're just as common as that donkey. We're just common everyday people. The question isn't whether we have value or not, because in God's eyes, we do. The question is, will we answer the call of Jesus? Will we come to him? Are we willing to come to Jesus? If we're willing to make ourselves available to him, he can use us to do amazing kingdom things. He can make a difference through us if we will allow ourselves to be used by him. Let's read on there and see how Jesus uses this common everyday donkey. This common everyday, get this, unbroken donkey to do something amazing. There in Mark chapter 11, verses 7 to 10. It says there in Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse number 7. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spared branches or spread branches that they had cut off the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. I never had that happen before. Something funny just hit me. It wasn't any of my sermon preparation. You know how you're just reading along and something funny hits you? I got to thinking, he's riding an unbroken donkey and they're putting stuff on the ground. I wonder if maybe they're trying to soften the pole. No, no, no. That was my mind, I know. I said, squirrel. What can I say? Squirrel. I just chased ADHD. Just had to overlook that. Once they untied this young donkey, <coughs> they took it to Jesus. And in my opinion, he worked another miracle. Now, it wasn't a healing miracle. Remember, I said Mark doesn't record any more healing miracles. But, but it was a miracle. If you don't think so, you go out and pick yourself an, un, an untamed and unbroken donkey or an untamed, unbroken horse. Throw you some cloth over its back and hop on and see what happens to you. We had a horse named George. True story. It's a Shetland pony. It's named George. I don't know why they named it George. But when you got on George... He laid down and rolled over on top of you. He was unbroken and he stayed unbroken because no one wanted to get steamrolled by George. That's just how these unbroken creatures are. I'll tell you what, it's no easy task to break an unbroken animal. You become a brock rider holding on for dear life if you hop on their back. But this young unbroken donkey, he was compliant. He did exactly what Jesus asked of him. No snorting, no bucking, no rolling over, and just walking, ambering through town. Get this, as the people screamed, can you imagine an unbroken horse or donkey with people screaming all around it? They were screaming all around this unbroken donkey. And still it just ambered through town with Jesus on its back. Now something we often miss because our culture is different. Culturally speaking, prophetically speaking, 
Jesus riding in on a donkey said something. But it seemed to be completely backwards to everything his disciples expected. I can just imagine Jesus' disciple and a perplexed look when Jesus asked for a donkey and goes riding it into town. You see, a conquering king, someone who was coming to conquer Rome and set up Israel as the one true nation on earth, <coughs> they would have ridden in on a sleek stallion. Showing their strength and their might. These guys were expecting a conquering king. They thought Jesus would have ridden in on a, on a beautiful steed. But that wasn't the case. The imagery was all messed up. He's riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. That symbolized that the war had already been won. His kingdom... It was secure and he knew it. It wasn't an earthly kingdom. He wasn't worried about defeating Rome. He wasn't worried about who the next leader was going to be, whether it's going to be Biden or Trump. He knew that ultimately his kingdom was not up this earth. And he was going to be victorious. By riding into that town on that donkey, he's saying, I am coming as a victor. Israel, she still wasn't, she wasn't freed from subservient natures to Rome. She was still underneath their thumb. But he's saying, I win. You can just imagine. Disciples, you can't see this outside, I'm scratching my head. You can just imagine the disciples scratching their heads like this. What's the deal with Jesus? I thought he was going to conquer Rome. What's the deal with him riding in like this? Now, it wouldn't take long for them to warm up to Jesus' decision. People were ecstatic. They were, they were using palm branches and laying them on the ground, clothing them, laying them on the ground to soften the path for Jesus as he came into town. Their words were clear and appropriately placed. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting Psalms 118, verse 26. Blessed are those is the one who comes in the name of the Lord on this day. This psalm that they're quoting is a celebration. Is saying the one who's going to deliver us from the guilt and power and punishment of sin has arrived. Someone has come. And those who had been enslaved by the curse of sin would soon be set free by the blood of Jesus. They didn't realize all that they were shouting, but we do because hindsight is 2020. Praise didn't end there. They went on to declare, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. <laughs> Hosanna in the highest. And you know, some people came up to Jesus. You have to read uh, Matthew and, and Luke and John to get these things. But, but some people came up and said, why are you letting them do that? Why are you letting them shout out your praise like that as you come in Jerusalem? And he said, I'm telling you what. If they didn't, these rocks would shout out my praise. That's how important this event is. The earth itself was crying out, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, I tell you what. This could have sounded just a bit seditious. These folks were encouraging Jesus to set up a promised kingdom. And I know what they thought was that he was going to set up a physical kingdom. They didn't get it yet. This crowd was walking a very, very fine line. Any overt suggestion that Jesus intends to assume a kingly power of some sort would have been met with quick and decisive action by Rome. Culturally, theologically, it was expected by the Jews that someone would come in and wipe out their conquerors and set up Israel. But God never wanted dirt in a bucket over there. He wanted an eternal kingdom in heaven. Their preconceived ideas... They seem to be coming to pass to them. But Jesus had something so much more in store. Not only for them, but also for us. This reality, the reality that this was an opportunity to really step on Jesus, did not escape the eyes and ears of the religious elite. They're soon going to use this commotion where Jesus entered into Jerusalem as part of their prosecution. In the mock trial that they're going to set up against Jesus. At that time, Jesus will open, declare himself to be Messiah, and he'll die for mankind. The perplexing thing for me is, 
How these folks could be so doggone fickle. Have you thought about that? Today they're crying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But in just a few short days, they're going to cry, crucify him, crucify him. My best guess is that today we have disciples. We have Passover pilgrims, ordinary Joes on the street. But in a few days, there'll be a crowd influenced by, and I believe even paid by the religious elite of the day to do their bidding. Watching what's going on in America today makes this make a lot more sense. It can easily happen. I mean, when the money of Soros and China meets the liberalism of Antifa and BLM, there's rioting in the streets. It happens today. It happened then. It's not something new. This stuff isn't something new. It's been going on for years. But it is something that is pure evil. It's here that we leave off our story today. And I want to close by asking you, have you come to Jesus? If he could use an unbroken donkey, don't you think he can use you? Doesn't matter how common we are. Doesn't matter how rich or how poor we are. Does it matter how educated or how uneducated we are? What matters is that we come to the feet of Jesus, willing to let him use us. If you're ready to come to Jesus, if you're ready to say, Lord, I might be ordinary, but I want to be yours. He's here with open arms today. If you're willing to say yes to his kingship, if you're ready, then now's the time to come as we sing together. Yes, Lord, yes. I'll say yes.